All right, Galatians chapter 3 is my text. We haven't been here for a few weeks, um, but we're looking at the last part of chapter 3 today. I've been thinking, uh, it's pretty common these days for there to be debates about inheritances and wills and so on. Um, Maybe you've seen uh, debates like this in the news before. I've got a hum. Ah, found it. All right. Maybe you've seen debates like these before. Maybe even in your your family, I don't know. Um, But oftentimes there'll be a very rich person who has an estate and uh, then the, the people get together, the family get together at the end, and they, they uh, open up the will, and the, the, the person in charge, the judge, or whoever reads it. And sometimes there's a, you know, quite something noteworthy. It's all going to the cat. Or, or maybe it's that the nurse stands up and she says, I deserve some of this because I've been caring for Mr. Smith for years, uh, years and years, and um, I was with him at the end, and the family weren't there. Um, I deserve this. And what's the judge going to say? The judge is always going to say, well, what does the will say? What does the will say? And uh, to be honest, I I don't have a will. I I started writing this a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh, no. And I saw you can do it online, and I thought it would be really easy. And it gets into some really curly questions like, what's going to happen to Joel? Things like that. So uh, we need to discuss this first before I do, do that. Because the judge is always going to say, what's in the will? What's it say? Where's Joel going to go? You might think it's unfair. You might wish it was done differently. But it's always going to be, what does the will say, right? As we listen to uh, Brandon reading these verses in Galatians, it might feel very distant to you. Talk about an inheritance and things like that. Uh, Some of the terms might seem very foreign to you. But what's behind this chapter is a debate about a will and an inheritance and where that inheritance is going to go. Uh, Who are the inheritors? And you might think, well, that's still not really grabbed me at this point. Why should I listen in? Because you have something to do with this. This is really about you. So the will being debated here is God's will this inheritance that he has for his people. And he's promised this amazing inheritance, and the promise goes right back in history. God creates this perfect world. That's where the Bible begins. Human beings turn away from the God who made this perfect world and made them, and as a result, they no longer enjoy this close relationship with God they had before. But instead, they're under curse. They're under judgment, uh, God's penalty. But all is not lost. Even in Genesis 3.15, there's the promise of things being set right there, very first time. But then you have God speaking to Abraham, like in Genesis 12 that was read earlier. And God promises to to Abraham this amazing inheritance. It's an an inheritance of blessing, not curse. Um, It's the promise of salvation, that God would bring his people back into that Eden-like relationship, um, his place, his land, his people, blessing to all the nations, and that they would be a part of this perfect world again, Abraham's descendants. So the question is, who are those who will inherit this, this amazing promise? Who, what, what are the terms of this inheritance? What does the will say? So way back in Genesis 12, God speaks about Abraham's descendants being blessed, and also through them, all the nations being blessed. And this amazing promise was foreshadowed all the way through the Old Testament. Um, And then when Christ comes, it was fulfilled. And the amazing news is, now that Christ has come, people from all nations, whether they are Jewish or Gentile, whether they come from Singapore or the United States or whatever language they speak, they can become people who can inherit this amazing blessing. Now, all that was common ground to the people in Galatia even between Paul and his opponents there. But at that point, you know, they would have been saying, yes, we agree. But there's still discussion after this point for them because the question then is, well, what are the terms of this uh, this inheritance? What are the terms on which people can inherit this will? So Paul made it clear that when he preached the gospel in Galatia that all people needed to do was to turn to Christ, to repent and to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and trust in him alone. 
But then some new teachers came into Galatia, and they were saying, no, no, if, you, if you're Gentile and you want to um, have faith in Jesus, that's not enough. Yes, have faith in Jesus. To be an heir of Abraham, though, to be one of Abraham's children, to be a son of God, which is to be the one that inherits this blessing, uh, you need not only faith in Jesus Christ, but you also need the law. You need to get circumcised. You need to uh, become Jewish effectively. And Paul is saying, well, once you do that, you completely change the terms of the will that God gave to Abraham. So this is relevant to all of us, because behind this debate about the, the will is really this question, okay, on what terms do I get made right with God? What are the terms? Uh, is it on the basis of my performance, me doing something? Is it on the basis of my obedience to the law or something else? Or is it on the, the basis of promise, God making a promise and keeping his, his promise, being faithful to his word? So this matters. And I wonder if there are people here today who would say, you know, I'm not even sure that right now I'm right with God uh, because God feels very distant to me. And I wonder, could it be, could the reason be, because you've never really understood the basis, the, the terms of this inheritance on which we relate to God, not your performance, but on God's gracious promise. Maybe there are others who would say, well, yeah, I, I've got that, I know that. But as we've seen in previous weeks, despite knowing in our heads what the gospel is, uh, sometimes it doesn't follow through with our hearts and with the way that we act and how easily we slip back into thinking, well, it's on the basis of what I do. It's on the basis of my performance and, and, and not just on what God's done for me. So my hope and my prayer this morning is that you understand this not just intellectually, that's a, that's a start, but that it touches your heart and you really see that the gospel means it's what Christ has done and you're trusting in his works and that changes everything. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, yes, that's our prayer, and we do pray that we would understand what you are saying here in Galatians, and that you would uh, change us intellectually, perhaps, but we also pray deeper that, that you would help us uh, to see these truths and to have them hit our hearts, and, and, and that we might delight in the gospel, in what Jesus has done for us, not our performance that makes us right with you, but Christ's faithfulness to all these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so three stages, if you have your notes in front of you. Um, three very simple stages in Paul's argument here. Stage one, verses 15 through 18, Paul is saying that the law is not the means. It's not the mechanism by which we inherit the blessings of God from Abraham, right? It's not the means. Which then begs the question, uh, well, then what was the purpose of the law? Which is pretty much Paul's words in verse 19. So Paul's response in verses 19 through 25 is the law prepares us for Christ, for the gospel, for grace. And then the conclusion, verses 26 to 29, through Christ we inherit God's blessing. So stage one, listen, the law is not the means, it's not the mechanism, it's not the way by which we inherit the blessing of God. So Paul says in verse 15, to give a human example, brothers, he's saying, let me take an example from everyday life, like a will, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it, nobody cancels it out, or adds to it once it has been ratified, once it's been signed, once it's, been, once it's on the dotted line there, nobody can change it or annul it. Um, you, you might not like the terms of the, of the will, but every single time the judge is going to say, well, what's the will say? Is it signed? Yes. Well, what's the will say? It can't be changed. And, and the particular will here or covenant that's being debated is the amazing promise, verse 16, to Abraham and his seed. And, and Paul has this little um, explanation here, and this is really good in verse 16. Paul makes the point at this stage that ultimately that seed, that son of Abraham, I like how when he was talking about that song, we used to sing that song, Father Abraham had many sons. Well, who are his many sons? And, and, and what, what Paul is saying here in verse 16, mom says she is, she is, yes. Um, a descendant of Abraham is in, in God's mind the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is that seed. He is the one who will inherit these blessings. And now listen. You say, well, what about me? We will only inherit those blessings. We'll only be inheritors through him, through Christ, right? It's by connection to Jesus that we too can inherit these amazing blessings of God. And Paul will come back to that later. So verses 15 and 16, very important. Now listen, this covenant, and I'm using language here. I know it's kind of Bible language. Um, a covenant is a binding agreement between two parties, two, two groups of people or two people or two individuals. In this case, this was Abraham and God. But in this case, it was a unilateral, and I'll explain that, unconditional covenant. So when you read Genesis 15, and you can do this when you get home, um, you know, when we make a contract, normally it's two-sided. I'll do this, and you'll do that. Um, or I'll pay this, and as a result of this payment, you will render me this service or whatever. And, and we might both sign that contract. Um, in the ancient world, if you had a really, really significant covenant, if it was a really important one, what you might end up doing, again, this is very foreign to us, but this is what they would do, they might take an animal and, and kill it and split it in two parts, the carcass in two parts, and then both parties would walk between the divided carcass. And in effect, what you're saying is, if we don't keep the terms of this agreement, of this covenant, let us be like this animal. That's pretty much what they were saying. Very, you know, blood all over the place, I can imagine, very, very serious. That's the kind of covenant ceremony that is described in Genesis 15. But listen, strikingly, Abraham doesn't walk through it. Only God walks through it. So God has made this unilateral, one-sided covenant, and God has committed himself to these promises. And with only God going through those two pieces, he's saying, I'm absolutely committed to this promise. Let, and he's really saying, let me die if I don't keep it. And then verse 17, 430 years later, God reveals his law to Moses. Now, you probably know how the history goes in the Bible. you got Abraham being made this amazing promise, Genesis. And then throughout the rest of Genesis, the promise is beginning to be fulfilled. Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. And Isaac has his children and Abraham's descendants. And by the beginning of the book of Exodus, 400 years later, more than that, they are in Egypt, a long way away from the promised land. That, and they're being oppressed. They're slaves. But God remembers that promise, and he rescues them through the book of Exodus, the, the Passover lamb and all of that from slavery. And they escape from the Egyptians through the Red Sea on dry ground. You know the story. And now in the wilderness, after being saved, after being rescued and delivered from Egypt, God speaks through Moses, and he gives them his law. And Paul is emphasizing now that the giving of this law does not change that original promise 430 years later. That promise preceded the Old Testament law. The promise was fixed and settled when God swore that oath to Abraham. And Paul is saying, hey, whatever the Mosaic law might have said or might be, it can't change this gospel commitment, this promise to Abraham. So verse 18, for if the inheritance comes by the law, which we know that it doesn't. That's what he's saying. It doesn't come by the law. But if the inheritance comes by the law, it, is no, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. And that promise to Abraham preceded the giving of the law by 430 years. So here's the point. Now listen, young and old, being friends with God depends on God's promise, not on your performance. It depends on God's grace to you, not on how perfect you are. Our son Joel, there he is. Joel is going through his final year of ATAR. Uh, now, do I owe you money if I use you as two examples today? I don't, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> what can I illustrate? My family. There we go. Yeah. And it's a very stressful year, so you could really use your prayers this year. You, if you've been through uh, those uh, courses and exams, it's very stressful. So I've been thinking about when I did ATAR. It was called TEE -E back then, year 11 and 12. My burden was a lot lighter. Uh, 
Um, not because I wasn't doing exams, not because I had easy stuff. I had economics and I had, you know, history and, you know, I, had, I didn't have physics and chem, but I had other hard stuff that was um, hard for me, music and human bio and so on. But what, what made it easier for me was, was that I wasn't shouldering this burden of having to get a placement in a WA university. I knew that I wasn't going to go to uni here. So I didn't have that burden on my shoulders. I was trying hard. I was doing the best that I could. I probably could have done a bit better. <laughs> Says mom. Amen. But I had pretty much been promised a place in Bible college in the States. I had I'd talked to people ahead of time. I had letters back and forth. Um, I had relatives that were teaching in this Bible college and this university there. So um, I didn't have that burden on my shoulders. I had a promise pretty much already. And it took the, the, the pressure right off me in year 11 and 12. In, in a similar way, but much more, there's a great sense of liberation here spiritually when you come to understand the gospel. So many People assume that the way to get right with God is by just pulling up your socks and trying harder and by being a better person and that your being right with God, your place in heaven, depends on your performance. But here's the amazing news. Getting right with God depends not on your performance but on God's promise to you. You remember uh, Pilgrim, Christian, carrying around God's promise. Wasn't he doing that? Or am I mistaking this? Pretty sure he was carrying around this scroll that was God's promises to him, which is his guarantee into the celestial city. So God promises to all who trust in Christ, he'll make you right with him based on his gift. It's a promise. And I wonder if you've grasped that yet. You can go to church for a long time every Sunday and not grasp this Maybe you're still trying to earn your way in. You need to trust in Jesus Christ as your only hope. You need to repent of your old way of living. You can't get there by yourself. can't get there at all by yourself. You need to trust in Christ. He's your only hope. And for those of us who say, yes, I understand that I've got it, let's not slip back into that performance mentality. Let's not go back to, okay, I've got to back, go back and do my ATAR now. You know, um, that kind of language how easily we do it. I've got to perform. I've got to read my Bible every day. And then if we don't, we're like, oh, not that reading our Bible is a bad, it's a good thing. You ought to be reading your Bible every day. You ought to be praying every day. But when we start to say in our mind, well, if I do this, then God will check mark, you know, and I get this, this extra, you know, blessing from him, or I've made church and church meetings a priority. All that's really good. You ought to be in church. You're disobeying God if you're not meeting with God's people. But the minute we start to say, well, Lord, I've done all this. I've really tried to achieve. Please bless me and answer my prayers. That's a problem. That's a performance mentality. Or maybe we're not performing and we're just gripped by guilt. You haven't read the Bible lately. You haven't been to church much. You have this besetting sin that you're really struggling with. And you're saying, Lord, here I am again. I'm back in front of you asking for forgiveness. Or or maybe it's that we can't even pray. We're ashamed and we can't even come to our Heavenly Father. It's not about your performance. It's about God's promise to you. So make that clear. The law is not the means by which we inherit God's blessing. Well, then there's a question, isn't there? Verse 19. Why then the law? What what was the point of the law? So stage two, verses 19 to 25, the law prepares people for Christ. It doesn't prepare us for being perfect little people. It prepares us for Christ. Prepares us to see that we need grace to see that we need the Lord Jesus to deliver us. So verse 19, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Because of transgressions. One function, now I, I wrote my sermon, then I looked up Michael Eaton this morning. Said, what does Michael Eaton have to say about this? And he added this bit here that I'll say now. And I thought, oh, okay. Anyway, I don't think I'm wrong. I think, I think there's a whole bunch of functions of the law. So here's one. One function was to restrain sin because there were heavy penalties attached to disobeying 
God's law. You commit adultery, penalty is death. You break the Sabbath, the penalty is death. You, all these things, the penalty is death. And they are in the promised land. The Canaanites were, were around them. The you know, Canaanites were very, very wicked. And one purpose of the law is to say, Israel, you live differently. Restrain that sin. And the law did do that. It did. If you want a bit of reading this week, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul says that the law is not for the righteous person, it's for the wicked. It's to re- restrain sin. The law is not for the righteous, but for the wicked. But here's a second function. Sin has always been sin. But once you have the law of God showing you the standards, it becomes clearer that this wrongdoing is an offense against God. It's falling short. It's going against God's standards. And so sin is seen very clearly for what it is as we look at the law. And so the law shows me who I am. I'm I'm not someone who deserves anything from God. I've broken his law. I'm someone who falls a long way short. I'm someone who's transgressed the law. It's like a mirror. It shows me up for who I am. Charles de Gaulle, I read the story and I try to find some um, certainty that this is really true. So I don't know if this is true. But anyway, Charles de Gaulle, leader of France in the 1960s, uh, quite a character apparently. He was walking through a modern art gallery, and as he would see each modern art painting, he would say, oh, that's terrible. Oh, look at that. That's really awful. And all the helpers and assistants were beside him and the the art gallery people. And just as he was about to leave the gallery, he saw another frame, and he says, oh, that's hideous. That's terrible. And And he walks out, at which point the nervous curator said, no, sir, that's not a painting. That's a mirror. (laughs) I don't know if that's true. I I read it and I tried to find some confirmation. But it's a good story. The law is a mirror. And as we look at the law, we see ourselves as we really are, as people who fall short of God's God's grace and God's gifts, all these things. Stott says, John Stott, the function of the law was not to bestow salvation, but to convince men of their need of it. Right? Right? Andrew Jukes, who was a famous uh, theologian, 1800s, Satan would have us to prove ourselves holy by the law, which God gave to prove us sinners. You get that? I love that. Satan would have us to prove ourselves holy by the law, which God gave to prove us sinners. So the law is given to show up our sin. We don't, we don't keep God's commandments. We, we can't keep God's commandments. That, that, that's a purpose that, that it had in history to show how, how far we fall from God's grace and from God's perfection. Verse 19, it was given for a particular purpose in a particular time. Verse 19, until the offspring, that's Christ, The offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. In other words, until the time when the perfect son of Abraham, the one who God always had in mind from Genesis 3.15 onwards, would come and would inherit those promises. And once he came, through him we inherit those promises. Do you follow? Do you get this? Some of you are smiling, some of you are like, when can I go home? All right, the law had a purpose, and it certainly didn't contradict that, that the promises. So verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. It doesn't cancel out the promises. Uh, you may know that you could you know, um, write a will, and then a little bit later you can write what's called a codicil, and you can adjust your will, which changes the terms of the will. And Paul's making it very clear. The law doesn't in any way change the terms of God's covenant promises to Abraham. It's not an addition. It's not a subtraction. Rather, it's used by God to prepare people for the Lord Jesus Christ, the the one who fulfills all of God's will um, and tells us that we need God's grace. So the law is like a mirror. I'm sure most of you look like you looked in a mirror this morning. Um, And when you looked... Uh, You might have seen that your hair wasn't perfect. You had that bedhead look, you know. Um, At which point, you didn't unscrew the mirror, you know, and pull the mirror off the wall and try to use the mirror to put your hair right. No. Having seen in the mirror what your hair looks like, you grab the right tool 
which is the brush or the comb, and you could look a bit better. The law is not designed to make us right with God. It's not designed to make us holy. It can't deal with the problem of sin. It just reveals it, makes it very, very clear. We see that we fall short, and so then we're prepared to look to the one, the offspring, who can make us right with his Father. So Paul uses a couple of illustrations. Uh, Verse 23, he says the law is like a jailer. I like this, 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Sounds very negative, doesn't it? Uh, But it's worth saying that this is not all that Paul wrote about the law. Uh, In Romans 7, he says the law is holy, it's good, it's wonderful, the law of God. The commandments are amazing. And God doesn't change. Once we come to him by the Holy Spirit, we will seek to live according to his standards, right? But it's through the Holy Spirit. But here, Paul has this particular point to make, and he's saying that all these perfect standards of God, these, these commandments, reveal our imperfection, and we fall short, and as a result, we see that we're under the condemnation of God. We are, as it were, in prison. We can't get out. We're stuck. We can't think of ourselves, oh, I'll just pull up my socks and be a good person, and then I'll be right with God. You will never be good enough. You won't. You you don't need the law to save you because it won't. What you need is a savior. What you need is someone to break you out of that prison and pay the price for your sin. So when the rescuer comes, we recognize that we're in the cell and we're so delighted to see our savior, right? You could be... I've seen those pictures in the States where they had these, you know, big estate-like prisons. You know, it doesn't even look like a prison. It looks like a country club or something like that. And and you couldn't even tell that you're in prison. But I suppose if you walked far enough, you would eventually see some barbed wire or something. And so here a rescuer comes into that estate-like prison, and you say, well, hang on. You know, I'm pretty happy here. We have games and we have crafts and we have classes I can take and there's a spa and so on. I don't need to be let out. It's not a prison. But the law reveals that we are in prison. So many folks out there in the world think, I'm not in prison, you know, but they are. And the law reveals their need to be free. The law is like a jailer. Verse 24, the law is like a guardian. And uh, it, it's, it's not like a guardian we have these days. You, you could say schoolmaster, but it's not really like a schoolmaster um, that we have these days either. I'll explain. 24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian or a schoolmaster, as the King James puts it. In in the ancient world, there's often a person in a family, often was a slave, whose job it was to supervise the raising of children. Um, And and not just to be a teacher, but to be like a moral disciplinarian guardian type person, right? Hard for us to understand because we we don't have the cane anymore these days and we don't have corporal punishment and so on. But these guardians were very, very strict Um, harsh disciplinarians. So the point is here with Paul, they only had a role like this for a limited time. It was a a short time. Once the child grew up, that guardian, that schoolmaster, could be left behind. And Paul's saying to those in Galatia who were trying to get people to go back under the law, he's saying, no, no, you've you've misunderstood this. The, The law had a particular role for a short time, but now that you've come to Christ, the law has done its job. It was there to prepare you for adulthood, for Christ, but now you've been set free by Christ. So don't go back to the prison. Can you imagine that? I want to go back to the prison. Or, don't go back to the schoolmaster. I want to have the schoolmaster beat me all. No, no, don't go back to the schoolmaster. Let me make application. Some of you are really, really struggling with temptation right now. I know because I I talk to you and I know myself and I know human nature. And I know that for sure, right, that you're struggling. Sometimes when we struggle with sin, um, we feel rightly convicted and the impulse, though, and this is wrong, is to avoid God. We say, Lord, you know, here I am, I was tempted, and I, and I fell again. 
and I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed. Lord, it's hard to come back to you. And we start to treat God like we would treat a jailer or a schoolmaster or a strict disciplinarian and not as our Heavenly Father who loves us. My kids always used to mess up. Their dad always used to mess up and still does. But if they messed up, I would never say, okay, Sam, you now. (laughs) Sam, you're out of the family. This was it. I've been keeping track, and now you're gone. You have to go find a place to live. We would never do that. He's my son. God would never do that with you. You don't treat him like a jailer. You don't treat him like a schoolmaster. But that's the impulse. We, we don't treat him like our Heavenly Father, which he is. So in those times when sin is really making you struggle, be reminded that God is your Father. He's not going to disown you. In fact, how could he when that sin has already been forgiven? And it's already been paid for. Do you follow me? Jesus has already paid for that sin that you did this week. That you did this morning or whatever. And, and, and there's no penance left to pay. It's been paid for. Sometimes we feel this compulsion to pay for it ourselves. Okay, now I just won't do these things ever again. And I'm, I'm going to really make it hard on myself. That's not our job to do that. If we trusted in Christ, then we've been forgiven. The price has been paid. We don't go back to prison You know, go back to school with that stern schoolmaster holding the the cane under his arm straight away. Some of you are thinking, okay, but hang on. Isn't this dangerous teaching? Are you suggesting that we shouldn't take sin seriously anymore? I'm not saying that at all. The Bible is simply saying here that we're not under the law. We're not under condemnation. We're not under that wagging finger. We've been removed from the domain of the law so that now we might relate to God in Christ by the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And that changes everything. Spend some time this week reading through the the next few chapters of Galatians and you'll see it's all about living by the Spirit. It's all about the fruit of the Spirit and, and, and not living this way but living that way under the Holy Spirit. So we're going to see how now that we've come to Christ and we've been joined to Christ, we've received the Holy Spirit and we find that there's a desire from within now to follow God. We don't have the law on the outside. We have the law on the inside saying, follow me, you know, be like me, I'm your model and so on. We're his people. And it's not the wagging finger. It's the light that we have from the Holy Spirit in our hearts We're his people, and therefore we long to live for him. Do you follow? All right, we'll get to that in the next chapters. So Christ bore the curse. It's wonderful. Um, The law is not the means by which we inherit God's blessing. Stage two, the law prepares us for Christ. Stage three, the conclusion, verses 26 to 29. Through Christ, we inherit this blessing of God. Through Christ. Remember, this, this whole section is a debate about who inherits the will. It's God's will, God's covenant. We are those who are the children of Abraham, is what he's saying. We are the sons of God. Now, incidentally, in the original, it's sons of God. Your Bible might have changed it. That's, that's interesting. But the reason it's sons is not to be sexist. It's that in the ancient world, it was the sons who inherited the, the, the will, right? They got the inheritance. And so Paul is saying, you're all sons. It doesn't matter if you're Gentile or Greek or male or female. You're all the ones who inherit that great blessing if you trusted in Christ. So verse 26, for in Christ, you are all sons of God. You all have that position, that status through faith. You're all inheritors. Uh, And in the context of Galatia, remember there are those who are saying that only those who are under the law will inherit the promises. That's who the children are. Paul saying, no, no, it's all those in Christ, all those in the seed of Abraham who are inheritors. Verse 26, how? Through faith, through faith. 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I know there's a debate here whether he's talking about water baptism or just being immersed into Christ. I think it's both, right? I think the the word means immersed. You've been joined to, you've been connected to, you've been put inside of Christ, and your baptism is a picture of that. But because you're connected to Christ, because you're in him, you are now connected 
an inheritor. You've put on Christ. God looks upon you and he sees not your sins. He sees not your shortcomings. He sees his son who's perfect and who's, who's righteous. You've put on Christ, he says. So his death, his penalty, paying the price is your debt that he's paid for. And God looks at you as somebody who's died to sin. It's already been paid. His risen life, because you're connected to him in Christ, you put him on, his resurrection is your resurrection. And now you're living a new life in Christ. And God looks at you as one who's never sinned because you're in Christ. The Spirit's joined you to him. You've put on Christ. And you know what? Now listen, if you grasp this truth, it'll have an amazing impact on how you view yourself. Just think of those Gentile Christians in Galatia who felt so delighted that through Christ they were right with God. Wow, we're, we're outside all these uh, you know, Jewish customs. Hey, but through Christ we're right with God. They were delighted. And then along come these, these false teachers who say, well, actually, uh, you need the law. What, what you really need is, is to do this and this this uh, to be right with God. And down throughout the ages, there have been those who've been making uh, those same kind of thoughts, even in churches. Uh, Those who are in Christ, you know, feel somehow inadequate. And you can't be totally accepted. You can't be truly blessed unless you dot, dot, dot do these things or don't do those things. One of my good friends used to be in a church in the 70s where if you accepted Jesus as your savior and you're up the front, in the back of the church would be two old ladies with scissors getting ready to cut your hair and make sure it wasn't too long. Because they're saying, okay, you've accepted Christ, but that's not enough. You need to look like this and have a haircut like that. And we laugh, but we can sometimes have similar thoughts in different ways. If you want to be blessed, you need this, dot, dot, dot. And then divisions can appear in churches based on all kinds of funny reasons. Cultural differences, social differences, economic differences. Well, you don't have enough money or you're too poor or whatever. Instead of the oneness that Christ has bought for us, there can be division. And even when no one else is looking down on us, we can look down on ourselves as we focus on performance. All I've got to do is this. Or as we focus on our failures, I haven't done enough. I'm so hopeless. I'm a failure. I'm a nobody. Listen, if I'm someone who's trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not a failure spiritually because I'm in Christ, right? How can I be a failure spiritually? I'm in him. Sure, I might, I might fail at times, and I, and I do sin, and I might feel that, but I'm not a failure because Christ is not a failure, and I'm defined not by my inability to obey, but I'm defined by his perfect obedience and his faithfulness and his sacrificial death. And God looks at me as someone who's in Christ, who's an absolute success spiritually, totally faithful to him. And when I'm clothed in him, what a difference that makes. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that distinctions are obliterated. He's not saying that. It doesn't mean that you should forget your nationality. It doesn't mean it's wrong to delight in your Jewish heritage or your Singaporean heritage or your American heritage. It's not wrong to do those things. It's not saying there's no differences between men and women. Of course there are, and praise God for that. But it's saying that those distinctions of gender, race, social background does not affect your relationship with God at all. And therefore shouldn't affect our relationship with each other. We shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Remember Peter in Galatia, and he separates from those who've been circumcised and he didn't eat food with them. It should have been unthinkable for Peter to do that because that's to divide what God has joined together, Jew and Gentile, because we're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one. In just a moment, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper with Andrew And I want you to look around at each other. It's very, very easy to define ourselves by differences, male, female, older, younger, European, Asian, wealthy, not so wealthy, whatever. And if we're not careful, it's easy to relate to each other on those basis of difference. 
And if we're not as careful, we can get clicky and we can gravitate towards other like-minded people of the same background or whatever. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And that should affect not only how we relate to the church, but how we relate to those outside. We're not better than them out there. We've been forgiven. We're under God's grace. But we need to tell others, look, hey, I need the gospel just as much as you do as well. So don't focus on the labels. Focus on Christ. Verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Father Abraham has many sons. I am one of them and so are you. So that old song. Let's pray. How we praise you, Heavenly Father, that you are a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. And we thank you that in your faithfulness, you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to fulfill your promise so that through faith in him, we can receive those amazing blessings promised so many years ago. Give us assurance through Christ of these blessings we've received as we keep looking to Christ and holding on to him. Help us understand ourselves and relate to each other based on this oneness in Christ. And it's through him that we pray. Amen.